Okay, so while uh, people are uh, still coming in, I'm going to uh, provide the filler and announce the lecturer. Welcome to the second of three lecturers from John Preskill, director of the Institute for Quantum Information and Matter at Caltech. This is the lecture intended for the general public, uh, which means we have the ritual slideshow. Um, Hans Data had already uh, retired when I arrived here as a graduate student in the late 1970s, but he remained a fixture over there in Newman Lab, so I did get to uh, interact him, with him uh, a bit. I'm going to uh, give my own take on the, the slides that have been uh, shown here frequently. We start with, uh, he was born um, in 1906 um, in uh, Strasbourg, Germany. And I, I, I just was pausing here. I have a note to remind everybody to pay attention because when I ask random undergraduates at Beta House on the West Campus, why it's named after him, they all think he must have been some kind of big donor without realizing that he was a scientist. So um, that's, that, that's why we do this. Um, his father's academic position uh, had his family moving around a bit. They ultimately settled in Frankfurt, and he began his higher studies in uh, Frankfurt uh, in 1924. In chemistry, he ultimately switched to physics uh, at the University of Munich, where he completed his doctorate uh, with Arnold Sommerfeld in 1928. This time frame, incidentally, put him among the first of the young scientists to explore applications of the then uh, new quantum theory. This was in the late 1920s. And indeed, at uh, age 24, he wrote a um, classic article on spectroscopy, one of the first applications of group theory in quantum mechanics. Um, during this period of, the, of his uh, late 20s, um, he went to a few places, including um, a few places in Ger Germany. He spent some time in Cambridge, UK, and he also spent some time as a visitor in Rome working with Enrico Fermi. So he got to know the major physicists at the time. Thing took, things took a downturn when he took a position as assistant prof professor at the University of uh, Tübingen, but it was government funded and during uh, an edict that was issued shortly after he arrived, uh, he was forced to be fired due to having uh, Jewish ancestry. And reading the writing on the wall, in 1933, he left uh, Germany for good. Um, while briefly back in England, he was recruited to Cornell. And this is a photo of him. He arrived in 1935, uh, there he is. And this is on the steps of this very building uh, we're in right now. This was before uh, either Clark, of course, or even uh, Newman Lab. We'll see the groundbreaking for that um, in a moment. And he started at a salary of $3,000 per year, but it instantly uh, put the physics department here on the map. This was before the surge of European physicists that made uh, US physici physics preeminent um, uh, after World War II. Um, uh, within a few years of arriving, he explained how stars burned hydrogen to become helium, starting the field of nuclear astrophysics, and that's work for which he won the Nobel Prize uh, somewhat later in 1967. Now, this photo, uh, oh, this is him uh, calculating uh, that uh, odd implement that he's holding, I think was used <laughs> um, this photo is the one I worked hard to find. Uh, it shows uh, Beta with uh, Werner Heisenberg, oh, I'm pushing into the mic, and um, they are uh, discussing the uh, wonderful facility that young physicists have with applied technology. <laughs> 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 you had to. Yeah, you said, right? Yeah. Um, okay. 
He took a few years of leave uh, from Cornell during World War II to be head of the theoretical division at Los Alamos. He reported to Oppenheimer, who he uh, uh, later supported in uh, testimony in his defense uh, during the, uh, when uh, Oppenheimer had his security uh, clearance removed. Feynman, Richard Feynman, who reported to him during this period, and this I have to read verbatim, uh, described, him, described him as, quote, a battleship surrounded by an escort of smaller vessels, the younger theorists, moving majestically forward through the ocean of the unknown. Um, when I was an employee, oh, there he is. When I was an employee at uh, Los Alamos 50 years later, it was nowhere, no longer anywhere near the ocean, as far as I could tell. <laughs> um, <laughs> live mic. Um, OK. Here is the photo I mentioned, the uh, groundbreaking for Newman Lab over there somewhere around 1946. A year after this, uh, famously, he went to a, a conference at Shelter Island in 1947. Many physicists of my generation still have this etched in our memory, even though it was before we were born, where uh, he heard about this anomalous uh, shift in the uh, frequency known as the lamp shift of the first two excited states of the hydrogen atom. And on the train back from New York City, he uh, did a calculation which we now would describe as uh, mass renormalization, uh, and it was able to uh, exactly calculate this effect, and uh, this paved the way for the revolution in quantum uh, electrodynamics. Oh, there he is. Um, uh, afterwards, he got, uh, well, he continued his science, of course. He got involved in a, a variety of things following World War II. He was one of the founders of the Federation of American Scientists. This is at nuclear uh, test ban talks. And he played a role, a leading role, in the public debate about nuclear weapons, defense policy, uh, and nuclear power. He was, um, oh, making sure we see who he is, researching, uh, he was uh, advisor to several US presidents on national security policy. He opposed the development of the hydrogen bomb, and his work on arms control helped lead to the limited test ban treaty of 1963. That was the one that banned uh, underwater atmospheric and uh, space testing. And I think, uh, yeah, that's me to the left. Um, <laughs> 1967. Uh, the Nobel Prize I mentioned. He continued afterwards to be a critic of defense policies, including opposing the Star Wars anti-ballistic missile program. He promoted uh, peaceful applications of nuclear energy. I heard him give a number of talks about this. And while he retired from Cornell um, in the mid-1970s, after uh, 40 years on the physics faculty, uh, the informal collegial environment that he fostered here remains one of his legacies. But he did not stop working. In 1986, at the age of 80, he helped solve uh, the solar neutrino problem that had mystified stellar astronomers for 20 years. And uh, overall, he wrote a major article, at least one for every decade of his 70-plus uh, year uh, career, including an article during his 90s about uh, supernova explosions. Um, he passed away in uh, 2005 at the age of uh, 98, but I think he got the last laugh. <laughs> okay, so now moving to today's speaker. Ooh, that took long. Um, whom I first met in 1975 when we took a group theory course together at Harvard. Uh, given by Sheldon Glashow, a uh, Cornell alum. John had just arrived following his undergraduate years at uh, Princeton, um, and he went on, went on to complete his thesis in 1980, advised by Steven Weinberg, yet another Cornell alum. Um, he remained at Harvard as a member of the Society of Fellows, then as junior faltry left for uh, Caltech in 1983, where he's remained since. Uh, he's currently the Richard P. Feynman Professor of Theoretical Physics. Uh, Feynman 
uh, having been one of Beta's recruits to Cornell in the late 1940s, and with all these connections, we consider John a virtual Cornelian at this point. He began his career in particle physics and cosmology, but in the 1990s became tantalized by the possibilities of using quantum physics to solve otherwise intractable computational problems. He's been a leader in, major proponent of, this ever-expanding field uh, ever since. And then finally, um, I do have to make one apology to the speaker. Um, we were unable to use his uh, <coughs> proposed abstract in its entirety. Um, apparently, his uh, quantum supremacist reputation having preceded him here, <laughs> uh, the total abstract uh, actually had these two additional words. Um, and the powers that be asked me to, if they could excise the word feeble. I actually have no idea what the issue was, but I still don't. But I uh, looked up my thesaurus and uh, made a few suggestions. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> Uh, inspired possibilities, but they were all mixed. And then I, I, I said, look, it's not as though he wrote what I would have written. <laughs> <laughs> Still no go. So, you know, after agonizing over this for months, um, I just, you know, left it and I said, okay, fine, you win. Excise both words, so there. So sorry about that, John. Um, on the other hand, they did uh, permit the final sentence here, uh, verbatim. Um, although, you know, frankly, uh, I'd say the jury is still out on those two points. <laughs> <laughs> so let us all uh, welcome John to make the case. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, it's a pleasure to be welcomed as a Cornelian by a scientist I much admire and have known for a long time. I think it would be uncontroversial to say that Paul Ginsberg is one of a kind. <laughs> and like many physicists, I very much admired Hans Bethe in the years after he officially retired from Cornell, he was a frequent visitor to Caltech, and he never lost his zest for science, or as Paul said, his ability to rack up scientific accomplishments, even quite late in life. So he was a, a remarkable man and scientist, and I'm honored to be this year's beta lecturer. The topic of my lecture is quantum physics, a topic that Hans Bethe knew well. And it's also about information. Now, we have information technology today, which is essential in our daily lives. But we all recognize that today's impressive technologies are to be replaced in the future by new technologies we can scarcely imagine today. It's fun, just the same, to speculate about future information technology, I may not be the best person to engage in that type of speculation. I'm not an engineer, I'm a theoretical physicist, and perhaps I'm not extremely knowledgeable about how computers really work. But as a physicist, I know that the crowning intellectual achievement of the 20th century was the development of quantum theory. And it's natural to wonder how the development of quantum theory in the 20th century will impact the technology of the 21st century. Quantum physics is a rather old topic by now. But some of the deep ways in which quantum systems, systems obeying the rules of quantum mechanics, are different from classical systems, we've only come to appreciate relatively recently. And those differences have a lot to do with the properties of information carried by physical systems. To a physicist, information is something that we can encode and store in the state of some physical system, like the pages of a book. 
But fundamentally, all physical systems are really quantum systems. They obey the rules of quantum mechanics. So information is something that we can encode and store in a quantum state. And information carried by quantum systems has some notoriously counterintuitive properties. That's why physicists like to speak of the weirdness of quantum theory, and physicists relish that weirdness. But we're beginning to take more seriously the idea that we could put that weirdness to work to exploit the unusual properties of quantum information to perform tasks that would be impossible if this were a less weird classical world. That desire to put the weirdness to work has driven the emergence of a new field, what we call quantum information science. And that subject derives much of its intellectual vitality from three central ideas, quantum entanglement, quantum computation, and quantum error correction. And the goal of this talk is to explain those ideas. So let's start at the very beginning. As you know, ordinary information can be expressed in terms of indivisible units, bits of information. And you might think of a bit as an object, let's say a ball, which can be either one of two colors, let's say red or green. I can put a bit inside a box. And then later on, when I open the box, the color ball that I put in comes out again. So you can recover a bit and read it. Now, information stored in a quantum system, what we call quantum information, can likewise be expressed in terms of indivisible units, what we call quantum bits, or qubits for short. And for many purposes, we can envision a qubit as an object stored inside a box. But where now we can open the box through either one of two possible doors, where those doors represent two complementary ways we can prepare the state or observe the state of a qubit. And I can put a ball inside the quantum box through either door number one or door number two. And then if later on I open that same door again, the color ball that I put in comes out again, just as for classical information. But if I put information through door number one of the qubit, and then later on open door number two, then what comes out is completely unpredictable. The color is chosen uniformly at random. So to read the information in the quantum box, you have to know what you're doing. If you do it the wrong way, you'll damage the information and it can't be recovered. So one consequence of that we can appreciate arises if I think about copying a qubit. Suppose I had a qubit copy machine. What would that mean? It would mean that I could put information in the qubit through door number one and then make the copy. And then when I open door number one on the original and the duplicate, the color that I put in would come out of both boxes. And likewise, if I put information through door number two, put the colored ball through door number two and made a copy, and then open num door number two of the original and the duplicate, the color I put in would come out of both boxes. But in fact, there's no such machine, no such device that copies qubits is allowed by the principles of quantum mechanics. And the reason is that in order to make the copy, the copier has to probe inside the box. And if it happens to guess right and open the same door that I use, then it could copy the information just as though it were classical. But if it guesses wrong and opens the wrong door, then it will irrevocably damage the information and there will be no way to build a high fidelity copy. So we might be able to clone a sheep, but we can't clone a qubit. Now, as you see, I like to think of qubits in sort of an abstract way. But a qubit always has some physical realization. And that physical realization can be chosen in many ways. Just so if you have something concrete to think about, I'll give one example now and mention some others later in the talk. The qubit could be carried by a single photon, a particle of light, which has an electric field which oscillates. And if that oscillating electric field is either horizontal or vertical in orientation, those correspond to the two possible states we could observe through door number one of the box. But if I consider the polarizations 45 degree rotated, 
The electric field along those directions corresponds to what I would see if I looked through door number two of the box. So I could prepare a horizontally oriented photon and then observe along the rotated axes, and in doing so, I would just observe a random bit. Now, the really interesting ways in which quantum information is different from classical information we can appreciate only if we consider states of more than one qubit. So let's suppose we have two qubits. And they could be far apart from one another. Let's say one is in my lab at Caltech in Pasadena, and the other is in the custody of my friend in the Andromeda galaxy. But these two qubits, a long time ago, were both on Earth. And they interacted in a certain way to establish a correlation between their states, which has unusual properties. Namely, I can open my box in Pasadena through either door number one or door number two, and either way, what I find is just a random color. Could be red, could be green, with equal chance. And the same thing is true for my friend in Andromeda. He can open either door number one or door number two and just finds a random bit. So it seems that neither one of us, by opening a box, can acquire any information about what's inside the boxes. And that's kind of peculiar because with two qubits, we should be able to store two bits of information. Where is the information hidden in this case? And the answer is, for this particular state of the two qubits, all the information is in the correlations between what happens when you open the box in Pasadena and you open the box in Andromeda. For this particular state, if I open door number one and my friend opened door number one, we'll always see the same color. It could be red or it could be green, but it's guaranteed to be the same. And that's true as well if we both open door number two. I see a random color, could be red or green, but if my friend opens the same door, he's guaranteed to see the same color as I do. Now, there are actually four perfectly distinguishable ways in which the qubit in Pasadena could be correlated with the qubit in Andromeda. We could see either the same color or opposite colors when we both open door number one or door number two. And by choosing one of those four ways, We put two bits of information into the boxes. But what's unusual is that neither one of us, locally in Pasadena or Andromeda, can acquire that information. It's shared non-locally between these two distantly separated boxes. And that property of quantum information, that it can be stored in this non-local fashion, shared between two distantly separated objects, is what we call quantum entanglement. And it's the really important way in which quantum information is different from information in ordinary classical objects. Now, correlations themselves are not unusual. We encounter those all the time in daily life. My socks are ordinarily the same color. So if you look at my left foot and observe its color, you know what color to expect before looking at my right foot. And it's kind of similar with these quantum boxes if I want to know what my friend will see if he opens door number one in Andromeda, I can open door number one in Pasadena to find out. And if I want to know what my friend will see if he opens door number two in Andromeda, I can open door number two in Pasadena to find out. So you might think, really, the boxes are just like the Soxes. But they're not. The boxes are fundamentally different than the Soxes. And the essence of the difference is there's just one way to look at a sock. But because we have these different complementary ways of observing the qubit, the correlations among qubits are richer and more interesting than ordinary correlations among bits. Now, this phenomenon of quantum entanglement was first explicitly discussed over 80 years ago by Einstein and collaborators. And to Einstein, quantum entanglement was so unsettling as to indicate that something is missing from our current understanding of the quantum description of nature. Now, that paper elicited some interesting responses, including an especially thoughtful one by Schrodinger. The way Schrodinger put it is, the best possible knowledge of a whole does not necessarily include the best possible knowledge of its parts. So what Schrodinger meant was that even if we know exactly how that pair of qubits was prepared, we know as much about the pair of qubits as the laws of physics will allow us to know, 
we are still powerless to predict what will be seen if I open the box in Pasadena or the box in Andromeda. And it was Schrodinger who suggested, using the word entanglement for these unusual correlations, and he also said it's rather discomforting that the theory should allow a system to be steered or piloted into one or the other type of state at the experimenter's mercy, in spite of his having no access to it. And what Schrodinger meant is that it seems odd that it's up to me to decide in Pasadena whether to open door number one and so know what my friend will find when he opens door number one in Andromeda, or to open door number two and then know what my friend will find if he opens door number two in Andromeda. But Schrodinger understood that these correlations, although different from ordinary classical ones, do not allow instantaneous communication between Pasadena and Andromeda. Because when my friend in Andromeda opens his box, he just sees a random bit. And that doesn't convey any information about whatever action I may have performed on my box in Pasadena. Now, the theory of quantum entanglement did not advance very much for the next 30 years until the work of John Bell in the mid-1960s. And beginning with Bell, we started to think about quantum entanglement in a different way, not just as something very strange, but as a resource that we might exploit to do useful things. I won't go into the details, but what Bell described is a kind of game that two players can play. Alice and Bob, it's a cooperative game. That means Alice and Bob are both on the same side. They're trying to help each other win. And the way this game works is that Alice and Bob both receive inputs, and the object is for them to produce outputs, which are correlated in some way that depends on the inputs that they receive. But under the rules of the game, Alice and Bob are not allowed to communicate with one another between when they receive those inputs and when they produce their outputs. They are allowed to make use of correlated pairs of bits that might have been distributed to them before the game began. And for this particular version of the game, if Alice and Bob play the best possible strategy, they can win the game with a success probability of 75% if we average uniformly over the inputs they could receive. But there's also a quantum version of this game. In the quantum version, the rules are exactly the same, except Alice and Bob are allowed to make use of entangled pairs of qubits that might have been distributed to them before the game began. And by exploiting that shared quantum entanglement, they can play a better quantum strategy and win the game with a higher probability of success, about 85% instead of 75%. So they can use the entanglement as a resource to do something, win the game, with higher success than they could if they didn't have quantum entanglement. And experimental physicists have been playing this game for decades now and winning with the higher probability of success, which Bell pointed out, the rules of quantum physics allow. So these unusual, stronger than classical correlations really are part of nature's design. Einstein had derided quantum entanglement he called it spooky action at a distance, which sounds even more derisive when you say it in German. <laughs> but it doesn't really matter what Einstein thought. Nature is as experiments reveal her to be, and we should learn to respect and love her as she truly is. So, boxes are not like Satsis. Quantum correlations are different than classical ones. You can win a game with a success probability of 85% instead of 75% if you have quantum entanglement. Is that really such a big deal? Yeah, it's really a big deal. And we begin to appreciate why it's a big deal if we think about systems with many parts. We can imagine a book, let's say it's 100 pages long, and if this were an ordinary book written in bits, Every time I read one of the hundred pages, I would learn another 1% of the content of the book. And after I had read the pages one by one, and had read all hundred pages, I would know everything that's in the book. But suppose instead it's a quantum book, written in qubits instead of bits, with pages that are highly entangled with one another. Then when I look at any one page, I just see random gibberish, which reveals essentially no information that distinguishes one highly entangled book from another. 
And if I read all of the pages one by one,